Hi there. So this guide is just kind of about venomous snakes that are present in Kansas. And I want to stress that it really only is talking about this state in particular. So first of all, when we're talking about venomous snakes, well, what is venom? Um, venom and poison are somewhat different from each other, although you'll hear them used a lot together. And depending on who you ask, they're pretty similar. Generally, when we talk about venom, we're talking about something that has to be injected into the bloodstream to be effective. Again, poison, like when we're talking about amphibians especially, skin-to-skin um, -skin contact or eating that animal while it's producing poison can hurt you. Uh, but venom has to be injected into the bloodstream to be effective. Venom is modified saliva with zootoxins present. So zootoxins means a toxin that is created by an animal. That's what the zo part means. So how can I tell if a Kansas snake is venomous? Again, these are... Rules of thumb that only work inside of Kansas. They don't work everywhere, um, but there's some pretty good methods for this part of the world. So some good methods. All of your Kansas venomous snakes have a rounded, semi-triangular head. It's, again, kind of fat. It stores those fangs inside of it, so it's a pretty wide head. All of the Kansas venomous snakes have pit organs near the nostril. So this organ that's right here, here's the nostril, here's the eye. There's that pit. That's, again, a heat-sensitive pit. That helps them with tracking prey, um, but all of them have that present. Many of the Kansas venomous snakes have rattles. Um, most of them are rattlesnakes, and they use them as a warning. There are non-venomous species that do this with their tails and dry leaves. They'll do that same shaking behavior, and it makes the same noise, but they are not venomous snakes in those cases, usually. So some other methods that aren't as good... Um, the pupils is one thing that I hear people talk a lot about as far as a way to identify a venomous snake. Um, they tend to be vertical or cat-like in a lot of venomous snakes, um, and non-venomous snakes tend to have a rounded pupil, but there are some non-venomous snakes that have the cat-like pupil as well, so it's not really the best rule of thumb. Um, <clears throat> many of your non-venomous snakes have paired scales after the cloaca, so if you're talking about the underside of the animal, the cloaca, again, is the area for getting rid of waste and for sexual reproduction. So it's near the very back end of the snake's body. Um, the scales on the underside there are pair paired after the cloaca. There's two rows of them. Most venomous snakes have a single set of scales after the cloaca. Um, again, both of these methods have their flaws in that you have to be really up close to the snake in order to tell those things are going on. And then the last one here, envenomation is painful. If you get bitten by a venomous snake, it's going to be really, really painful. Um, and you don't want to go with that method because it involves you getting bit. So again, these are not as effective for um, identifying a venomous snake. In general, as a general rule of thumb, just leave snakes alone if you can um, and be careful around them. Um, but this guide is designed to help you identify the venomous ones. But generally, if you leave snakes alone, they're going to leave you alone, too. Most of them are not interested in trying to attack you. But again, this can help you figure out maybe if you're dealing with something more dangerous. If you happen to be in the southeastern United States, if you vacation in Florida or anything like that, this picture here is of the coral snake. It is venomous and has almost none of the characteristics that most venomous snakes in the U.S., which are mostly pit vipers, have. And when you start getting outside of the United States, then you're, it all goes out the window. We're starting to talk more and more about other types of snakes beyond pit vipers. So again, keep in mind that there are venomous snakes that don't fit that mold of what we've already talked about. So here are the different types of venomous snakes here in Kansas. The broad-banded copperhead and eastern copperhead. Sometimes I see these listed as the same species. It just depends on how recent the study is. Um, the northern cottonmouth or water moccasin. Um, again, a close relative to the copperhead. The western diamondback rattlesnake, timber rattlesnake, the prairie or western rattlesnake, all of these pretty closely related together. They're all in the genus Protalis. And then the western Massasauga, um, another smaller kind of a pygmy rattlesnake by comparison. So here, if we're looking at copperheads, um, this is an animal. The length will be up to about 40 inches in really larger adults. They're usually found in eastern Kansas, if you're going to bump into one. The bands on the body are wide. There are lots of striped snakes in Kansas, but again, these bands are pretty darn thick. Um, the bands almost have an hourglass shape sometimes. You can kind of see that here at this young end, that there's a little bit of a curve there. Um, 
They can be gray, light brown, reddish brown. Again, copperhead is kind of a general term for one of the color morphs on it, but it can change depending on um, the individual. Juveniles have yellowish or greenish tails. So we can see here with this young one, very bright yellow tail at the end there. And they mostly live in wooded areas. Again, that skin pattern that they have helps them blend in um, with dead leaves, especially. So form a camouflage for them. Cottonmouths or water moccasins, these ones get up to a length of about 36 inches at the max. They're very rare in Kansas. Uh, most of the time when people run into a water snake and they say, I saw a, cat, a cottonmouth or a water moccasin, chances are it was a different type of water snake that's non-venomous but also dark in coloration. Um, but if you're in very southeastern Kansas, you might bump into these. Um, they can be dark gray or black with bands. They usually have some kind of banding to them. Um, the juveniles, again, have those yellowish or greenish tails, and they're usually found near streams or still water. Um, in the fall, they'll den in the ground, so they go into holes in the ground during that part of the year. The western diamondback rattlesnake, um, pretty darn big here, a length of up to 59 inches. Very rare in Kansas, um, usually on the southern border of Kansas. You might see them along there. They have this distinct white tail with black bands, pretty good warning system on there. They have dark diamonds on the back with white edges. Again, pretty distinct marking there that you can identify. They can be yellowish gray, pale blue, pinkish brown, so a variety of colors. Um, they have pale white bands between the nostril and the eye, so these very thin little white lines that you see there on either side of the face. And the juveniles look pretty much like the adults. They mostly live in rocky dry areas. The timber rattlesnake, length of up to 63 inches, another larger rattlesnake. These are usually found in eastern Kansas. They have a black tail, again, makes them kind of distinct. Dark bands or chevrons on the back, again, that kind of V-shape that's on there. They can be pinkish gray, yellowish brown, and one really neat characteristic, they have this reddish stripe on the back a lot of the time. So that's one way to identify a timber rattlesnake against other snakes of a similar pattern. Juveniles, again, look much like the adults, and they mostly live in rocky hillsides. The prairie or western rattlesnake, length of up to 57 inches, usually found in western Kansas when you're getting more, again, into prairie territory. Makes sense. Um, they have a large rattle on a dark banded tail. Again, you kind of see those little dark lines and then that black tip before the rattle. They can be green to brown with blotches on their back. Um, they can be greenish gray to light brown in terms of their overall coloration. The young, again, look like the adults, like with all of our rattlesnakes. They live mostly in rocky canyons and open prairies. And then finally, our western Massasauga, length of up to 33 inches, much smaller than the other rattlesnakes, found throughout Kansas. They're the smallest Kansas rattlesnake. They, have a, they can be gray to light brown in coloration. They have these dark brown blotches on the back. The young look just like the adults, and they live mostly in prairie and wetland areas. So just as a quick note here about a type of snake that most people don't consider venomous, and here, let me move my video here real quick. Garter snakes is one that you've probably encountered a lot, or garden snakes, I've heard some people call them. Um, they were largely considered to be non-venomous, but studies in the early 2000s showed that they do produce a neurotoxic venom. A lot of people think it might be due to the fact that they eat a lot of toads. However, the venom itself is so mild and the teeth of a garter snake are so weak, it poses no threat to humans. So sometimes a snake might technically be venomous, but not enough to warrant a big warning. Again, if you're looking at this on Classroom, this video here is a Sci Science Friday um, one about the diary of a snake bite death. So this was someone who worked at Chicago's Field Musician, or excuse me, Field Museum, that was bit by a venomous snake, and he took a diary of his last days before he died. Um, very kind of emotionally unsettling video, but again, a powerful video to talk about how venom works. So real quick, the first aid for venomous snake bites, if you do find yourself in a situation where you're bit, always call 911 or any other emergency number first. Monitor if the bite site itself changes color or swells up or starts to feel painful. Here you can see those two little bite marks there. Um, move out of the snake's striking distance. You don't want to get more envenomation because the snake can inject more venom and make the danger level go up. Remain still and calm to slow the spread of the venom. Again, the slower your heartbeat is, the better. Remove jewelry and tight clothing. Again, the ability to um, be able to breathe clearly is important. 
If possible, position yourself so the bite is beneath heart level. So again, if you're bit on your foot here, you want to keep your foot beneath heart level, which is pretty easy. Um, but if you were bit on the upper extremities, you might need to move yourself so where you're upside down so that the bite is beneath heart level. Clean the bite site with soap and water and then cover it with a dry dressing. There are a few things that people think are good for venomous snake bites, but these are all the things that you should not do for a venomous snake bite. Do not use a tourniquet, so again, tying something to kind of create extra pressure there, or apply ice to those sites. Don't do that. Do not cut the wound or try to remove the venom. There's tons of times where people talk about sucking the venom out. Don't do that. Those things aren't effective. Do not drink caffeine or alcohol. It can speed up the body's venom absorption. Do not try to capture the snake. Again, you'll probably get more venom in the end. You can try to get a picture of the snake to help with identification when you arrive at the hospital if you are at a safe distance. And then finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about rattlesnake roundups. Rattlesnakes are sometimes captured in large numbers for public events. These events usually involve killing the rattlesnakes, but some just showcase them for educational purposes. Again, you have to look at the event to kind of get clarification. Many people argue that the roundups are important for human safety and to help get rid of what they consider a pest species when they think about rattlesnakes and their impact, especially out west when you start looking at areas with lots of livestock or lots of people that could get hurt. Others argue that the roundups cause animal cruelty and may harm populations of snakes that help keep rodents in check. So again, depending on the event, sometimes they do really inhumane things to these animals, cutting their heads off while they're alive, showing people the still beating heart, um, and sewing their mouths shut while showing them off to people. So again, it depends on the event. Again, if you're looking at this on Classroom, these videos kind of help to give a little bit of perspective on the rattlesnake roundups, both in terms of the people who support them and the people who are opposed to them, so you can form your own opinion on them. So I hope that this, I, excuse me, I hope that this helped with identifying some of the venomous snakes here in Kansas and understanding what to do as far as first aid treatment. Again, I would just make sure that you try to give snakes a lot of respect um, and you shouldn't have to worry about any of these types of issues. But if you do find yourself in a situation with a venomous snake, hopefully now you have a little bit more knowledge on what the best course of action is.